Well, good morning, everyone. This is Marcia Walden, President and CEO at Destination BC. Thank you for joining us once again. And for our tourism industry update, um, I'd also like to thank our Coast Salish people from whose traditional territory I'm joining you today. This week, we have three guests here with us, uh, Andrew Headley from Golf BC, Joss Penny from the BC Lodging and Campground Association, and Matt Jennings from Fishing BC, uh, all of whom are here today to speak about how their sectors have approached reopening and what the landscape is starting to look like so far for these sectors. Um, I'll also be sharing some findings on behalf of the BC Hotel Association and Ingrid Jarrett, who couldn't be with us here today, but had some great uh, and recent data. Uh, Ingrid, of course, <clears throat> excuse me, has been a panelist with us previously on an industry call, and uh, she's always got some great information about what's happening in our accommodation sector. So I'd, uh, I'd like to share that with you today. Um, and after that, I'm going to share a bit more on the two topics um, around consumer sentiments um, and findings. First, uh, some high-level insights that have been provided by uh, tourism destinations around BC, uh, all around BC. Uh, I, I got some feedback from the community DMOs and uh, regional DMOs um, for different parts of the province to see, just check in and see what's happening. Uh, and how that first weekend um, that we've had in July has looked. And then second, we'll have some findings from the latest research wave that speaks specifically to the resident sentiments um, that we're seeing around travel. So with that, let's jump in and start with our guest speakers. Our guests today are here, as I said, to share their experiences with the reopening process and then some of the challenges that their sector has faced what they're seeing so far in terms of visitation, and a few insights um, perhaps into the, the uh, survival strategies that their operators have used for the summer and um, are, are thinking about for the remainder of 2020. I think you'll hear some very different perspectives from each of them. And then I'm gonna come back after their presentations with a couple of questions for each of our guests that uh, I hope you'll find interesting. Um, given the number of participants that we have on the call today, um, which is usually up over 300 or so, uh, we're not going to be able to facilitate a live Q&A with our uh, panel guests, um, but we will um, invite you to submit any questions that you may have via Zoom, and then we'll uh, ensure that we're able to answer your questions in the days after the call uh, via our corporate website. So to kick us off, I'd like to introduce Andrew Headley, Vice President of Golf Operations for Golf BC. Andy began his career with Golf BC in 1996, and in 2006, he became Vice President of Golf Operations. He works with a very talented leadership team, which supports all aspects of the business, including HR, procurement, grounds maintenance, golf operations, food and beverage, marketing, finance, and admin. And Andy is currently president of the BCGMA, the BC Golf Marketing Alliance, which works to market British Columbia as a golf destination. And he's held a seat on the Allied Golf Association board since 2011. So welcome, Andy, and thank you for being with us today. Take it away. Thank you very much, Marcia. Thank you for having us. Uh, um, uh, well, I think we're gonna jump onto some slides here. So I'll get Kate to pass us over. That's great, thanks, Kate. Um, and we'll just jump onto the first slide. Um, again, um, this we're uh, the, B the BCGMA assists with long haul marketing for the regions and provides a central reservation and call to action for all the BCGMA provincial marketing programs. Many of the courses ch chose to close in mid March after the announcement by the World Health Organization. However, some did remain open. Uh, the golf industry, did, we consider ourselves fortunate that we were able to remain open. Um, as we can operate while maintaining physical distancing with a maximum of four players per tee time. However, staying open came with its challenges and, uh, and those were developing the protocols while effectively still operating. Uh, the BCGMA are, as, as Marcia said, a part of the Allied Golf Association and we were instrumental in developing a comprehensive best practices document that can be used by, as a base for our stakeholders to create training manuals and procedures 
Developing the protocols was difficult, and I'm, I'm not being critical of any of the authorities as we're dealing with unprecedented scenarios. However, it made it challenging to write these procedures when the goalposts were changing da daily in various regions of the province. Um, a majority of our courses reopened in the middle of, to the end of April with a completely new set of guidelines and operating protocols, and those have been developed as, as time has moved on. Uh, if we could just jump onto the next slide, Kate. What could have been, um, just, just, uh, just looking at these numbers here, uh, last year we exceeded a million dollars through our BCGMA central reservations, and this year we're on a pace to exceed that. As of February 29th, you can see here we were up 127%, uh, which, is, which equated to 275,000 versus the same time last year. We can just move on to the next slide, thanks. Unfortunately, what was, um, we, uh, we, uh, we saw the, uh, we basically, the, the long haul basically, even as late as March 10th, was outpacing last year. However, once the reality of the situation became apparent, the long haul cancellations came flooding in and we're now down over 70% year to date. We still have approximately 250K on the books as of June 30th. This is predominantly British Columbia and Alberta traffic. Just jump down to the next slide, Kate. Thank you. Uh, this is a, a national golf course owners uh, reporting rounds played as of the end of May. Um, this is a uh, majority of golf courses uh, across the, the nation report their rounds in here. Um, there are some, uh, some, some, uh, some positive signs here. As you can see, the year to date across the, across the country, we're down 25%. However, in BC, we are up 3.99%. Um, that increase is probably driven predominantly from the members, pass holders, locals who were uh, travel restricted uh, during the, uh, the, the months of, uh, of, of March before we closed and then again in, in May. If we can just jump on. The, uh, the revenue shortfall here, unfortunately those, those increase in rounds didn't generate additional revenues. Um, as you can see here, BC was it's down year to date uh, 16.7 percent and May is at 18.4 percent. We can jump down to the next slide. Um, we just put some numbers here together uh, to give you a little bit of an idea of what's happening across the province in terms of uh, in terms of golf. Um, unfortunately these numbers aren't apples to apples um, but uh, it gives you a general understanding of the situation. Some of these are golf package numbers and some of them are related to green fee rounds and numbers but please remember none of these numbers here that we're showing some of these percentages do not include food and beverage revenue or retail revenue, which were actually hit even harder. If we can just jump onto the next slide, thank you. So we've got here a quadruple bogey for the golf tours, tourism. In total, the BCGMA had seen a, 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 a $762,000 in cancellation due to the COVID-19. Of that, we've been able to move for over 400,000 to 2021. Um, and based on our booking projections prior to March 1st, it is estimated that COVID-19 has cost the BCGMA a little over a million dollars in sales, 1,500, 1500 room nights and 2,800 rounds of golf. If we can just jump down to slide nine. Um, as you can see, we're vastly different market mix from 2019 uh, through to 2020. Um, but however, we're confident we can encourage travel from within Canada as regions become more comfortable with accepting visitors. As I mentioned earlier, we still do have 250,000 on the books at the moment. We can just jump onto the next slide. So uh, these are some results for our golf in BritishColumbia.com website. Uh, we've been pleased to see an increase in our website traffic in the last 30 days. Sessions have increased 10% and new sessions have increased by 5.7% to 80.2%. So onto our COVID survival strategies. Um, as, you, as you can imagine, March 13th, we canceled, paused all of our campaigns. Um, and uh, on May 25th, we reached out to a $20,000 in new subscribers with a Golf BC local and Explore BC soon messaging, including, uh, including some planning and we received a 28.8% open rate and a 13.9% click-through. 
On June 8th, we commenced a paid search, paid social and video campaigns in BC for the first time ever. Typically, our provincial efforts are focused on mid to long haul markets. However, supporting our nine regional golf destinations in the return to the market is part of our recovery strategy. And there was growing sentiment from the tra for travel and interest on our website. June 24th, with the phase of uh, uh, phase three, sorry, the, the announcement of phase three, we commenced paving the way into Alberta for our Gulf regions with online campaigns. However, there is a tremendous amount of negative sentiment requiring very diligent comment management. Um, again, with the phase three announcement, we sent out our second COVID era consumer mailing, promoting BC golf road trips and packages and secured a 26.9% open rate and a 14% click-through rate. July 6, we returned to Ontario to assess golf for sentiment where there and rekindle efforts commenced in February and March. Um, we'll see if we can uh, drive that a little bit uh, into the summer or, or it may get pushed to 2021. We'll resume marketing again in the US uh, probably in 2021. Um, but we'll be meeting with our BCGMA Advisory Council in September for further input into our recovery and resilience strategies. We've maintained our social community presence and engagement throughout, uh, following DBC's lead with Explore BC Later, Golf BC Later and Explore BC Local, and effectively growing our Facebook community by 24%, Instagram by 97%, and Twitter by 10%. Just jump onto the prospects. So since the announcement of phase three, we have heard some positive reports from the Okanagan with regards to Alberta traffic. The courses I oversee are reporting green fees above 2019 in the first week of July. Predator Ridge Resort is currently running at 70% occupancy for the month of July and are fielding between three to 4,000 calls a week. The BCGMA is doing what we can to make up for losses by booking smaller road trips from rubber tire markets. The interest is definitely there from the domestic market, but it obviously takes a lot of weekend getaways from domestic foursomes to fill the crater left behind by the cancellations of the large international groups. Metaphorically speaking, COVID-19 dug a big hole with a massive excavator, but we have our shovels out now. And we're filling in the hole as best we can. We're hopeful to make a few birdies in the next few months. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Well, thank you, Andy. Um, clearly, uh, like most in this province, it was a very, very rocky start this spring, uh, but it's heartening to hear what's going on in the golf sector right now as, um, as we get into July and phase three, and hopefully some of the early signs that you've seen continue and, and strengthen with time. And thanks as well for all that uh, update on the BC Golf Marketing Alliance's work. Um, to, to see uh, how the lead generation programs are going. So now, uh, you're, thanks for joining us. Um, so now I'd, I'd like to hear from the BC Lodging and Campgrounds Association, which is a sector that uh, represents over 400 motels, motor inns, hotels, resorts, lodges, B&Bs, campgrounds, and RV parks all across British Columbia. Joss Penny is the executive director at BC Lodging and Campgrounds Association, and Joss joined uh, the association in March of 1988. He's the current chair of the Camping and RVing BC Coalition, a uh, position he's held since 2008, and he sits on the board of the Canadian Camping and RV Council. So welcome, jo Joss. Marsha, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my first slide, oh. Um, Unlike many other businesses, uh, campgrounds were not declared, were declared a non-health essential service back in March. So we weren't uh, forced to close and we didn't choose to close. Uh, we were a non-health essential service because we assisted housing long-term winter rentals, Canadian snowbirds returning from the United States, and those essential workers that needed to uh, live in uh, RVs full time. The BC Lodging and Campground Association recommended campground and RV parks that were open only for self-contained RVs via full service sites to prevent the virus spread in the beginning. We held a, a webinar March the 24th to discuss the pandemic with our members. The association then began developing operating guidelines for the members that they could quickly react to the pandemic. 
The procedure for touchless reservations and check-in check-out was agreed. A guest code of conduct and a waiver was written and circulated. No tenting, just self-contained RVing units was the message. Plus, keep washrooms closed and no on-site day visitors. As the pandemic worsened, BC parks and rec sites closed in late March after spring break. A second BCLCA uh, webinar was held May 19th to release the COVID-19 operating guidelines and start members preparing for recreational camping. On June the 1st, with the BC government announcements of phase two and private sector campgrounds began to align with BC parks and rec sites opening for recreational camping. Summer season only campgrounds and RV parks began opening under enhanced protocols to prevent the transmission of the virus. This included opening washrooms with twice the normal daily frequency of cleaning, posting signage, laundromats open by appointments, but still no tenting sites and no on site day visitors. Private sector campgrounds began accepting reservations from BC and other Canadian uh, residents in, in May. Phase three started June 24th with Premier uh, announcing that hotels resorts could begin resuming operations for BC travelers. Many campgrounds at that time began to accept tenters and operating ancillary services such as playgrounds, beaches, dog parks and clubhouses. But on-site day visitors are still not encouraged even today. It was good to have the non-essential travel advisory lifted by the Premier on the 24th for BC residents. However, pre-planning and reservations are strongly recommended to secure a camping spot this summer. Next slide, please. This slide shows the month-by-month -month summary stats for the CampingRVBC.com website. This is a website that is hosted by the Camping and RVing BC Camping uh, Coalition. It's a co-op sector group under Destination BC, and this ta table tracks the website activity of the consumer in 2020 versus 2019. Uh, you can see uh, uh, when COVID hit in March, there was a drop off of visitors uh, to the website year over year of 12.95%. Uh, and in March, it, it, uh, uh, that was the case. And in April, it dropped again, 23.89%. As people reacted to the travel closures and the non essential travel advisories around the world. But in May, and more precisely around May 23 to 25, there was a tremendous spike in camping interest. That happened to coincide with the opening of the Discover Camping Reservation System for BC Parks and the announcement that BC Parks and Rec sites were opening June 1st to BC residents. You can see on this chart that traffic increased 150% in May. 2020 over the 2019 figures and 210 percent in June in 2020 over the 2019 levels. This is a trend that's continuing right now. Next slide please Kate. Uh, this slide displays the uh, uh, Google Analytics from January the 1st to July 6th and shows the visitation patterns uh, on the website and the spiking users around the opening of the Discover Camping Reservation System. That peak that you see there is over 11,000 visitors that visited on May the 25th, which was the first day that Discover Camping was open. This visitation has tailed off, but the visits have maintained between three and 4,000 visitors per day, being largely from BC residents looking to escape the lockdown through camping in the outdoors. People visit the website looking for places to camp or RV as the camping campingrvbc.com site lists and maps over 1,750 campgrounds around the province of British Columbia. That is a mix of the private sector campgrounds, Parks Canada, BC Parks, and rec sites. And you must remember that Parks Canada only opened to camping on June the 24th. Next slide, please. To measure the impact of COVID-19, the BC Lodging and Campgrounds Association in partnership with Destination BC and using the services of Align Consulting, began collecting reservation and booking data so we can see the pace of bookings. This survey is undertaken every two weeks with the same group of campgrounds. And this slide shows the second wave results to June the 14th. Although bookings are picking up from the last wave, 2020 still lags well behind 2019 actuals. You can see that for June, they were only at 59.4% of the same of the reservations that we had in 2019. 49.3% uh, uh, in July, 44.6% in August, and 32.1% in September. Next slide, please. 
Nearly every cap grain surveyed still had availability throughout the summer. So do not believe the media hype that there are no places to camp or RV. There are still places that you can find. The further north you go, the more availability there is. These folks traditionally relied on the Canadian, uh, American and European rental traffic. The American and European rental traffic has evaporated. So if you're planning a camping trip, support the campgrounds in the Caribou, Northern BC and Northern Thompson. The chart on the right shows the impact of COVID-19 on the origin of campers. The mix of customers is notably different from 2019. The gray bar is 2019, the blue bar is being 2020. You can see that we've moved primarily 83% of the bookings to date being from British Columbians, which is no big surprise. The big change is in the Alberta resident, which has been impacted by the non-essential travel advisories coming from both provinces. The closer to the Alberta border a campground is located, the more they rely on this business. One takeaway for the future this summer and fall is we need to encourage intra-provincial travel between BC and Alberta, as this will have a significant impact on campground and RV park revenues. Looking forward, I think the camping is in a strong recovery mode over the summer. If we have a moderate wildfire season and no major spike of the virus, then I think occupancy season July, August and September will be stronger than could have been expected two months ago, especially in Southern BC. On the horizon, we have an opportunity to house the snowbird population, those Canadians that live year round in their RV, as there will be a reluctance to migrate south this year to the United States as in a normal year. Thank you, Marsha. Well, thank you, Joss. Um, we've certainly been watching your sector for many months now, knowing that uh, camping and outdoor activities and the lodge and cabin style accommodations would very likely be the bellwethers of recovery for uh, for the whole province based on what we saw in consumer research and and the preferences that um, that British Columbians have for how they'd like to travel so we'll we'll continue to watch your sector with great interest to see how you fare as the summer unfolds and um, obviously we're hopeful that some of this early uptick you're seeing will will strengthen with with time so now let's hear from one of British Columbia's pioneering sports and tourism sectors. Matt Jennings is the executive director of the BC Fishing Tourism Association, which is a nonprofit industry sector association that represents over 160 members, primarily freshwater fishing resorts and angling guides from all across our province. Matt also manages the Fishing BC marketing campaign that promotes both the freshwater and tidal fishing sectors. He's an avid angler himself and is a strong advocate for rural tourism in BC. So welcome, Matt. Oh, thank you for uh, allowing us to speak about our sector. And I just want to, there's some similarities between what Joss just spoke about and, and what I hope to speak about today. But uh, in general, I think like everyone, um, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty early on. And uh, in the fishing sector, you know, people are required by law for the freshwater and tidal side to uh, require a fishing license. So we've been using fishing, fishing license sales data, uh, especially from the freshwater side as a bit of a proxy for participation. And uh, while there was some worry early on, it didn't take long for the license sales to prove that uh, what we already knew is that fishing was gonna be a, a popular activity. It's a safe family friendly activity and you know, the old moniker of uh, wide open spaces and few faces is exactly the product that we have. And so fortunately we get um, very up-to-date license sales data from the freshwater angling side. And up as of Ju July 6th, um, license sales overall are up 3%. Um, for BC residents, it's up actually 8.5%. <clears throat> and then for non-residents, year to date, it's down 23%. And then obviously for non-resident internationals, it's, uh, it's decreased significantly. And so while one caveat I should point out is that while license sales are, are up in general, um, we anticipate significant drop in, in overall revenue from license sales as the July through September period is, is often when a lot of the non-residents visit, visit British Columbia and their licenses are significantly um, more expensive. So if we can go, just go to our first slide for the recovery survey. 
So like Joss, we use Align Consulting for, uh, and we did a, a survey that uh, ran between May 22nd and June 14th. And this first slide just talks about opening status. So similar to Joss, uh, a good percentage of our operators also are in the RV campground space. And a lot of, as you can see here, 40% of them uh, in that time frame didn't close. And this speaks to demand mostly, is traditionally a lot of our resorts, especially in the interior here, open up kind of in that mid-May, around the May long weekend. And demand was just through the roof that a lot of, a lot of operations just couldn't turn people away and they weren't ordered closed. As you'll see kind of 40, um, roughly 41% of businesses were open. The other one that I'll point out there is only 3% of the surveyed uh, businesses said they were closing permanently for, for the full season, which is very unfortunate. Go to the next slide. Uh, in terms of planning to open, as you can see, those that weren't open already in, by the end of May or early June were planning to open it imminently. And I think this kind of echoes either, you know, they were, they were, that's their regular time of opening. But I think a lot of it was really waiting for the, the go ahead from the provincial government. And a lot of folks thought that was going to happen on June 1st and went ahead and opened. And then obviously it took a couple weeks after that till officially the phase three. Can we go to the next slide, please? And so this is a this is the big one is is the market share uh, uh, in before as you can see you know we have roughly thirty nine percent of the license or, of respondents said their uh, their stakeholders were from British Columbia twenty four percent from the rest of Canada forty four total from U S and overseas and so while this graph you know shows that it's a pretty balanced mix uh, of of visiting stakeholders. I should put in the caveat that this, this is not balanced per individual business. We have some businesses that rely on 75 to 80% just BC residents. That might be more like the small interior resort. And then we have other businesses like angling guides, you know, in the East Kootenays or in Northern BC or tidal water operators, high end resorts, that it's complete opposite and 90% um, is US or overseas. So what, what, while in general, our sector is positioned very well to, to weather this storm, it's, not, it's definitely not equal for everyone. There's some extremely hard hit businesses. And while some of our interior resorts, you know, some of them are, are completely full for the season, others obviously still have a lot of availability. And then others are seeing extreme, extreme cancellations. But like, like I believe um, the, in the golf sector, where when I say cancellations, we our, our industry relies heavily on repeat clientele, and a lot of those people have decided to book for next year. So that's uh, that is a positive. We hopefully will re retain those people. Go to the next slide, please. Yeah, and so just key findings in general is uh, you know we had about 59, 59 tourism businesses, um, three percent or only three percent are closing for the year. Most businesses had, had definitely planned to open by June and some kind of in July. All fishing, almost all fishing businesses had capacity mm -hmm. and that's not unexpected. That, and we already talked about kind of that overall market mix. And, you know, while some, some feel like they'll be able to believe that some of that international clientele, they'll be able to make it up. But, you know, I'll just be perfectly honest with some of those operators that relied on 90%, it's just not going to be feasible for them to uh, to make up that clientele with domestic markets. We're gonna do everything we can to support them and try to kind of stop the bleeding and salvage this summer. But uh, it's just not realistic to to replace all those visitors. You know, the next slide, please. Yeah, and so in general, in terms of marketing recovery, you know, people thought the survey said, focus on BC and Alberta markets, which is what we're doing now. Um, a big focus is obviously the fishing experience is, is really a, a safe and family friendly experience. And so we're, we're actually trying to take the positives and, and hoping to, to introduce a lot of new families or reintroduce them to the fishing experience. I've been saying this, you know, over, over time, there's been a lot more competition for people's time in terms of year round soccer, year round other sports. And so I think we've, since a lot of those kind of tournaments and stuff have been canceled, we've seen people kind of 
return to the fishing tradition. And so uh, hopefully, you know, they'll, they'll have a great experience and we'll be able to reintroduce folks and it'll show, a, show up in future license sales as well. And that's it for me. Well, thank you so much, Matt. Um, the wider interest that we're seeing in fishing uh, this year is certainly a fascinating development. And I'm gonna ask you a little more about that uh, in a minute. Um, so thanks to each of you for your insights and your perspectives on what's going on in your sector and in our industry. And uh, as I said, I'd like to just take a moment to ask a little more about your thoughts on our industry um, from the perspective of, of your sector or more generally as you see fit. Uh, so I'd like to just begin by asking, you know, when you think about recovery, what is the one thing that you think um, community DMOs, um, you know, provincial DMOs, visitor centers, sector organizations, and others um, could really do to help uh, tourism get restarted? Is there something in particular you'd really focus on? So, um, Joss, let's start with you. I think the most important thing I would say <clears throat> is to talk to your elected officials uh, to get intra-provincial travel between British Columbia and Alberta in place so that uh, all non-essential travel can occur throughout the balance of the pandemic. Uh, I think the Alberta market is extremely important to us uh, and we need to access that as soon as possible. Right, okay, thank you. Um, uh, Matt, I'm going to pitch a different, slightly different question at you. Um, obviously, we saw some stats about the geographic source markets for, um, for your sector being quite different, not surprisingly. Um, but are you seeing any other changes in the demographics of, of uh, people who are fishing this year? Yeah, and I, you know, we use license sales as a bit of a proxy. Obviously, that not every single one of those is participating with a tourism business, but uh, you know, they're all, all, most of them are traveling around the province and their visitors. So of that eight and a half percent BC basic license sales, that's, that's up eight and a half percent. Some interesting demographics there is actually 50, there's a 55% increase in the 16 to 25 year old angler. And there's a 15% increase in the 25 to 34 year old. And so there's definitely an uptick in, in the younger demographic. And traditionally, the fishing demographic has been very heavily focused on the older age groups of baby boomers. But over the last couple of years, there has been an uptick in, uh, in kind of that millennial group. And, and that's great to see, uh, you know, fishing is hopefully gaining some popularity. And, uh, and you know, hopefully as those folks move into having higher incomes, it'll translate into supporting tourism businesses like guides, resorts, charter operators, things like that. Yeah, in, in, interesting and maybe boding very well for the, for the future as a, as a uh, sampling exercise this year. Um, so maybe same question for you, Andy, um, other than the geographics of, of the golf industry, are you seeing any changes in the demographics uh, of, of golfers that are, um, coming to your properties and, and uh, all around the province? Yes, we are, yes. We're seeing, uh, we're definitely seeing um, a sort of what we call sort of intermediate play. So sort of 20 to 35 year olds um, and either, either joining through uh, reduced membership uh, opportunities or through um, green fee play, uh, which, is, which is very positive to see, you know, younger people coming into the game. Um, the lesson programs have also been very popular um, and we've seen, um, you know, with, I think because people are, th are looking for things to do, uh, we've definitely seen an increase in our, in our group bookings, uh, which are sort of up to a maximum of six people uh, running uh, children's lessons, um, ladies lessons, um, which have been very positive to see that. So, um, you know, we're just encouraging that, you know, as many people to come out and and try golf, uh, make it as accessible as possible, uh, and see if we can create some more raving fans. Great. Well, we certainly have lots of good golf product all over the province, so um, that's encouraging. Um, and Joss, how about you? Uh, on the demographics, we're certainly seeing a, a large upswing in 24 to 35 uh, year olds that are coming into the camping and wanting to rent RVs for the first time. 
Uh, like uh, Matt alluded to, I, I think we're also seeing that because they can't uh, uh, go do team sports or do other activities, uh, that they're turning to camping in the outdoors and hiking as a way of, uh, uh, of taking their energy out. We're also seeing a, a, a switch that we hadn't anticipated that 52% of our searches on our website are male as opposed to female, which is the normal uh, search. So that's a real change. And I, I would assume that would probably relate to the fact that some people aren't working that uh, usually are working. Mm, yeah, really interesting. So I'm going to throw something um, to all three of you that's a bit of a lightning round of short answers, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a bit of a controversial one in that we know there's lots of tensions around the province um, with, you know, whether or not some communities are ready to welcome visitors. And we hear lots of anecdotal reports of um, people forgetting their travel manners, as uh, Dr. Henry would like to say. Um, so to what extent, if at all, are your operators experiencing that with um, people maybe not observing the protocols? Um, Joss? Uh, we we tackled this issue head on with a code of conduct. Uh, each campground requires the pe person in the party to sign that uh, they're going to maintain the household, their social distance, they're going to have parental supervision of their children, they're going to keep them physically distant from uh, others. And because we've uh, implemented that, we haven't actually seen bad behavior within the campgrounds. Uh, the only behavior that we've sort of seen is some community behavior whereby they, they've been a bit against some of the plates that are in their community, in particular American plates or Alberta plates, there's been a bit of pushback. But that seems to have died down uh, with since the uh, June 24th announcement. Great, yes, and uh, I think Dr. Henry's uh, continual advice for us to not jump to conclusions and to be kind perhaps is sinking in uh, across the province. How about you, Matt? Yeah, I would say, you know, anecdotally, just what I've seen posted on social is, is that, you know, in the heat of the moment, people are in a boat fighting a fish, uh, maybe forgetting to put on their, their face mask. I don't, I don't see it so much from the operators because obviously they, they're, they are sticking to the code of conduct that we put out. But I think just wearing that non-medical mask isn't, isn't super commonplace for everyone yet. And it's, and, because it has, you know, it's, you even see that out in the local grocery stores or whatever, but it's just people kind of uh, not used to, to, to following those rules. So I think it, over time, I think people will definitely be getting kind of used to that and, but in general, we haven't had any, any complaints and our operators, there are the resorts, angling guides, charters, very professional, uh, have everyone's health and safety in mind. So, so we're not too concerned, but I think it's just more on the, the visitor side. They're just not into the habit of it yet. Right, great. Well, that, that's good to hear. Um, Andy, last comments? Yeah, just uh, very similar. We, we've, you know, with regards to golf, you know, it's an outdoor recreation and uh, we, we haven't had too many challenges with, with the actual golf, uh, with playing golf, but uh, where we've, we've had to keep reminding people is in many, uh, many areas now the golf course clubhouses are open for food and beverage. And so obviously with reduced numbers, but um, we have to keep reminding people of their distancing. Um, people start to get comfortable and so um, you know, we've set up many of our facilities with drop-off tables and things like that, but people start to, they kind of forget. So you're always reminding people, um, you know, not to get too close. Um, and so, you know, that's definitely a, an area uh, dealing with the food and beverage side of the business is, is, is for sure the most challenging. Um, and, and, you know, and then again, going into the, the tourism side, we've, we've had, you know, requests through the BCGMA for Americans to play en route. To, through, through to Alaska, and obviously we, we, we can't allow that. And we've also had groups that uh, anticipating that the border might reopen are uh, trying to book tea times um, and, and not realizing that they would have to quarantine if the borders did open. So, you know, there's been a lot of different uh, scenarios, but uh, on the whole, it, we have to be diligent. You have to have your, as, as Josh said, you have to have your protocols in place. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's just gonna be a reminder um for for the uh for the, for the consumer yeah well thank you andy i think vigilance is probably the watchword of the month um, while we uh tiptoe into this new phase three we want to make sure that we don't um 
have any missteps as we move along. And thank you all for, um, for joining me today. I know it's an incredibly busy time for everyone in the industry as we, um, as we restart. And uh, I'm sure that everyone on our call today really appreciates the work that you're doing for our industry, for our sectors, and for some of those insights that you've shared with us today to give us a, a better sense of what's going on out there and, and what things might look like for um, each of your parts of industry in the months ahead. So thanks to uh, all three of you. Um, I'd, I'd also like to spend some time just sharing a few highlights that uh, were provided to us by the BC Hotel Association. Um, let's start with looking at some of the occupancy rates for the province as a whole. And um, uh, you can see these broken down into uh, regions and by month. And um, overall for the province, uh, the average expected occupancy for July is still very low at 35.7%, improving a little bit for August at 386 uh, and then dropping down again for September at 25% and October at 20 point, um, oh, sorry, 25% for October and 20.5% for November uh, and ta tapering off again. So, while we are seeing that the booking windows for accommodation are, are very short now, um, as people kind of sit on the sidelines waiting to see what, um, what the health officials say is permissible about travel, um, and also trying to determine um, what they feel comfortable with um, for travel options for their family. So we can see that um, our hotel sector continues to really struggle. And uh, the outlook at the moment remains pretty weak for the rest of the summer. And of course, for all of us, this is a very significant concern for the long-term health of our industry and for the accommodation supply choices that we can offer visitors uh, in the future. In particular, I know in conversation with Ingrid that um, our gateway cities of Vancouver and Victoria uh, are particularly hard hit uh, due to the border closures and the loss of their international clientele and cruise business in the summer. And of course, the meetings and convention businesses on the shoulders and being that mainstay of constant supply throughout all seasons. So we will continue to work very closely with our community DMO and sector partners to help address this accommodation crisis and um, continue to keep a close watch on that. Now, on many of our past industry calls, we've uh, tried to share perspectives and insights with you from uh, a variety of sources. And uh, I will provide an update on BC residents' per uh, perceptions for you in just a minute. But before I do, uh, and now that we've heard some of, from some of our sector organizations, I'd like to just share a quick snapshot of what the first weekend in July has looked like across the province. Now, I will say this is not scientific. This is more uh, anecdotal feedback that I've solicited from a cross section of um, tourism destinations and DMOs uh, and visitor centers across the province, just to give us a sense of what we're seeing in the reopening of our landscape so far. So let's start up north um, with Smithers, where downtown restaurants and shops uh, appear to be quite busy, according to locals. And um, in conversation with uh, Gladys, she just wanted to point out one note of particular interest was a hotelier uh, who said that being really clear and forthright about um, the increased COVID safety measures that they had put in place, uh, which were very extensive on this property, was really paying off in their work to attract corporate clients. So when, um, when they had businesses calling about putting their personnel into this property via phone, just very carefully reiterating all of their extensive safety procedures uh, was reportedly what was sealing the deal for those com companies wanting to house their staff in those locations. Um, Whistler and Kelowna have both noted that a large proportion of their bookings are coming in with a very short booking window, as we've heard. Um, and that weekend bookings just over this past couple of days doubled in the course of a week in some cases. So in general, these locations appeared to be picking up some steam, but they both have still lots of availability. So as you heard earlier, 
All those media reports that our tourism hotspots are already full up are simply not true. There's capacity all throughout our province. Um, and in both Kelowna and Whistler, the hospitality scene is also starting to visibly ramp up. Um, and golf courses are seeing pretty steady rounds of play from both members and residents uh, with a quite a bit of increasing visitation from outer out of towners. But as you heard earlier, um, still lots of opportunity for more growth there. Uh, from a Soyuz, where uh, we heard anecdotally that um, some wineries were reporting sales of uh, sales increases of as much as 300% over last year and that while their tastings are going very well, more of their consumers are actually there to buy rather than just uh, taste for recreation. So that's a nice, um, a nice uh, new development for, the, for our wine business. In Kamloops, uh, hotel occupancy levels are starting to rise and they're up about 25% from mid-June, though still overall the hotels are sitting at about 40% occupancy. Kamloops reports that they're seeing some pretty good uptake for both golf and mountain biking, so that's good news. Uh, over in the Caribou Chilcotin Coast, uh, the Visitor Center in Williams Lake said that they're down about 50% year over year, um, as is most of the fixed roof accommodation in the region. Um, Nobody is really doing much better than 50% and regrettably some of the properties are reporting occupancy as low as 0%. <clears throat> so we know the Great Bear Rainforest continues to be closed, of course, uh, but most of the rest of the region is open and very glad to be welcoming visitors. In Victoria, where of course international business and particularly US business has always been very core to their summer success, most hotels and attractions, as I said earlier, are really suffering. Um, we are hearing that the restaurant and pub scene is quite vibrant and many establishments are certainly taking advantage of the new street space that's being made available and um, they're building decks or patio extensions to be able to provide more seating and get to those viable levels of operating capacity. But uh, the hotel sector um, is still pretty bleak. Uh, there are a few bright spots for Victoria on the horizon in terms of um, re-establishing air routes between Toronto and Victoria and also with the potential for flights from Montreal to start again later this summer. So we look forward to seeing how that unfolds. And in Vancouver, um, if you were to look at the local beaches and parks, you'd think that there was nothing amiss around here. They're very, very uh, crowded and popular. Uh, most people still maintaining a physical distance, but that being a very popular pursuit right now. Um, but uh, Metro Vancouver's hotels and attractions are still way down, hovering at 10 to 20% of the usual volume that they would see at this time of year. <clears throat> So to buck that very sluggish restart in our major tourism centers, um, we're really collectively going to have to continue to grow confidence and travel among British Columbians um, and hopefully uh, be able to open up our borders sometime soon with um, Alberta. Everyone all across the province needs to feel safe going anywhere in the province, including to urban centers for vacation and, and for staying in our hotels. And by and large, our hotel sector has done an excellent job of readying themselves with all these new health and hygiene procedures. So they are ready and willing to welcome guests. And we just need that consumer confidence to, um, to start to populate those heads and beds. So we need to encourage our uh, locals also to be a tourist in their own town. And that will really help some of these attractions um, uh, to, to get the locals to participate in activities and to visiting the attractions in their communities. And there's a lot of family and friends um, visitation going on now. So that's a good opportunity for us to encourage those attractions, um, visits to those attractions. And we're certainly all trying to do that, I know. From DBC's perspective, uh, every corner of our province uh, is being covered in our new domestic marketing campaign, which is promoting the six new experience collections that are intended to inspire British Columbians to rediscover their province this summer, and later to also reintroduce our province to Canadians uh, across the land. 
We have, uh, as you know um, from my previous calls, perhaps uh, an inspirational layer of advertising that we call our hero content, which is really um, uh, fed mostly by uh, big visual videos and, and print that feature each of the six experience collections for, for TV, uh, for newspaper, for social and digital channels. And we hope this will motivate British Columbians to um, consider doing some uh, new and different things and taking multiple vacations this summer. Each of these experience collections has its own um, uh, vignette on social and can also be found on our consumer YouTube channel um, if you want to look them up. Uh, we also have another layer that is more about informational content, which resides on um, explorebc.com and hellobc.com, where we showcase sample itineraries that will help people actually plan their trips, so move from inspiration to planning. And we're both directly and indirectly through our partners connecting people with bookable experiences all across the province. We have thousands upon thousands of uh, businesses listed in our business listings, and we're also featuring many of them in uh, some of our social posts, making sure that our marketing activity is connecting to your cash registers. So lots more campaign elements, um, itineraries, articles that we work with with uh, media around the province and bookable experiences, of course, will continue to be featured throughout the summer to keep our messaging um, fresh and interesting to British Columbians. And um, we're also ready to launch our marketing into Alberta and other Canadian markets when the time comes. And of course, I just want to mention that our, you know, our city DMO partners, our sector partners, they're all really key to inspiring British Columbians to explore their communities and get out and do things. And with the marketing funds from our, from our co-op program, which um, has, now has very relaxed requirements around matching funds, given the circumstances that most of our partners are in, as well as the new funds that have been provided by Destination Canada through DBC, we know that our community DMOs have major marketing programs um, uh, underway and, and just getting into market to entice British Columbians uh, to visit places. So together, there's about $20 million in marketing stimulus that's going into BC's domestic market this year. And um, we're giving it our all to, to try to really get British Columbians out and about. Uh, we also know that looking ahead, uh, the role of visitor servicing will be very important uh, for the local focus of tourism in the months to come. And our, our visitor centers are playing an integral role in providing British Columbians with uh, accurate travel information, particularly about what's open uh, and recommendations for their local markets. And so here are a few insights from what visitor centers experienced in these first few days of July. I'll start with them. Um, uh, going down to the southeastern part of the province and, and um, connected with Sparwood. Uh, and they saw a huge increase in traffic in the beginning of July with about 900 visitors through their visitor center doors just in this last weekend, um, which was considerably more than they saw in the same period last year. Uh, their visitors um, were expressing interest in um, and a lot of excitement, apparently, uh, just about camping and biking and rafting and, uh, and wildlife viewing, very much an outdoorsy focus, um, not surprisingly. Uh, and Sparwood reported that the recreation sites in their area were actually approaching full capacity this past week, so that's good news. In Golden, um, while their visitor center has seen a significant drop um, due to the Albertan um, uh, market being a key one for them, uh, they are reporting that self-contained lodges and cabins are very popular in their area. And um, we did hear that there's a glimmer of hope, certainly for the future, that the hotels in the area are uh, once again receiving inquiries for tour group series from South Korea and China for 2021. So BC is still top of mind for when that international travel is able to resume. Kelowna's Visitor Center, which just reopened on June 28th, um, has seen about 400 people a day, they said, since opening. Uh, and their visitor experience team is um, 
handling uh, uh, an additional 200 inquiries a day. So while that's down substantially year over year, it's encouraging nonetheless that um, their services are really uh, being sought after. And you can see a picture of their wonderful new um, visitor center that just opened on the lakeshore there about two years ago. In Chilliwack, uh, they have a new mobile visitor center that's being very well received by visitors and residents alike. And um, I thought quite interestingly, their Chilliwack branded apparel is selling really well out of their new mobile visitor center. So that's, I think, an indication that community pride out in the valley is very strong. Um, they also reported that the local breweries seem to be packed and um, they're seeing lots of new visitors come into the community. So whether you're traveling in your own backyard or to a neighboring community, uh, one thing I think remains true. There's still a lot for BC residents to learn about and explore within our own province. And uh, with a geography that's the size of France and Germany combined, um, BC offers a truly amazing array of choices that are unlike any other place on the planet. And we want to encourage British Columbians to see as much of it as they can in the coming years. So now just a couple of words on the international situation. Um, it looks like our US border will continue to be closed until there's um, better containment of the virus down south. Um, and as we look south, it becomes uh, very evident just how important it is for BC residents to continue to observe our health and hygiene protocols so that we can continue to support travel and we can continue having visitors come to our communities all across BC. Many people are pointing to the May long weekend in July as sort of the beginning of the resurgence in the US. And um, so, uh, you know, we've also seen what can happen when we lose our vigilance, uh, not just in the US, but down under in Australia, the state of Victoria has had to backtrack and return to lockdown because of a second wave of COVID-19 virus outbreaks. Uh, and Australia has generally been extremely successful in containing the virus. So we certainly don't want to see that happen here in BC. So vigilance remains the watchword. With almost uh, every industry call, we've been sharing some form of public perception insights with you, whether it's from our work with um, Insights West or Destination Canada's work with uh, Leger. So as you will likely recall, we track BC residents' perceptions to get a sense of whether communities would be comfortable um, welcoming visitors amidst this pandemic. And today we have the fourth wave of research insights to share from our work with Insights West. So this wave, um, which was launched to BC residents the day that phase three of BC's restart plan was announced on June 24th, and the survey stayed in field until June 28th. So it's just prior to the long weekend um, that we gathered these perceptions. Um, so in wave four, I think uh, we still see a cautious response being the most notable. Um, even though a downward trend was seen in previous waves, concerns have uh, increased now that we're into phase three. In wave four of this research, 51% um, of BC residents are still showing concerns about welcoming visitors from other parts of BC into their community, which is up a little bit uh, from the 43% that we saw in wave three on June 10th, uh, but of course down quite a bit from the early days of May 13th. Um, so if we all travel safely and use our travel manners, as Dr. Henry calls them, we hope this number will continue to improve over the summer. I will note that concern was most evident for Vancouver Island residents who about welcoming visitors from other parts of BC onto the island. Um, and similar to previous waves of research, there was really no significant change that was seen regarding concern, concerns about welcoming other Canadians Americans or other countries um, visitors into uh, communities. And I guess that's pretty understandable since those markets are really not even open yet for travel. So no change in perceptions there. Now on this next slide, there's a lot going on, um, but the key takeaway I think is that intentions to travel um, have plateaued in wave four. Um, however, in the short term, meaning really just over the next four weeks, intentions to travel within BC remain strong and they're similar to the previous wave. 
intentions to travel to US and other countries over the next year um, have declined since wave three. And I think more and more people are getting realistic about what um, the long term looks like uh, for international travel. Um, and of course, the desire to have a vaccine or treatment available before traveling to the US or other countries is now at its highest since we began traveling with over 30% of British Columbians now feeling that way about leaving their own country. <clears throat> and I guess now that the EU, um, the European Union has indicated that uh, Canadians will be welcome in Europe, uh, we'll see if any of that travel intent turns into actual bookings as um, as they uh, gain the ability to travel to Europe. In addition to the Insights West research, um, Enveronics Analytics uh, releases weekly some mobility data that captures the movement of people who are traveling around BC. And movement in this case specifically means that they're 60 kilometers uh, or more away from their usual evening location. So this chart captures all movement within BC by any domestic traveler. And we also see that in this last week, there was a greater uh, decline in movement compared to recent weeks. But over time, over the course of this entire uh, chart, you can see that there's a trend of increased mobility, though still less than last year. Uh, and as we heard through the public perceptions research, travel intentions within BC by BC residents remains pretty encouraging over the next four weeks. And we're hopeful that the general trend of weekly upward movement that we see through the uh, Enveronics mobility data uh, will continue moving forward. Uh, we can also see that movement continues to vary across tourism regions in the province. And while all regions are continuing to experience less movement uh, than they did in 2019 during the same period, um, we can see that this is amplified in a number of regions um, like the Caribou, Chilcotin Coast, and the Kootenays, where movement slowed down considerably compared to just weeks prior. And here we see domestic movement within BC. This is June 28th, so week over week, um, comparing one week to the next uh, in 2020. So same year, uh, week over week cha uh, change. And again, we can see domestic movement within BC with increasing mobility week over week for both the weeks of June 21 and June 28th in every region. So net-net, uh, I think that we are seeing positive signs right across BC. We're seeing the green shoots of recovery, uh, but we really need the growth rate of this recovery to accelerate substantially in the next two weeks in order to propel us through summer and fall and, as we say, uh, save our summer. So in wrapping up, uh, I'd like to thank Andy, Joss, and Matt again for joining us today and for sharing their insights with all of us. Uh, we continue to update our corporate website with industry resources as information is made available. Uh, we're working closely with government to get answers to many of your questions um, where that's the source of them. And we're sharing information on our social media and in our weekly newsletter um, to help our industry partners. I'd like to thank you again for joining us today. Um, and for the 3,000 or so of you who watch these YouTube visit, um, uh, recordings at, at other times, uh, but thank you for those of you who join us live. Always appreciate it. Um, moving forward, our industry calls will be happening on a biweekly basis to report on the developments as the summer unfolds. And as always, recordings of these calls are posted, as I just mentioned, um, to our COVID resource hub at destinationbc.ca each week. So please keep your ideas, questions, and concerns coming. And do reach out to us via COVID-19 response at destinationbc.ca. Thank you for joining us again today. Take care. <laughs>